It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots of security news. We're going to talk about everything under the sun. And then Steve's going to take a look at and explain why iOS is inherently insecure because of a design decision Apple made when the first iPhone came out. Wow. iOS app security coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 532, recorded on November 3rd, 2015, verifying iOS app conduct. Security Now is brought to you by Bowl and Branch, the most comfortable sheets on the planet. If you order right now, they'll give you $50 off a set of sheets plus free shipping. Go to B O L L A N D B R A N C H dot com and use the offer code Security Now. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now. And by IT Pro TV. A good IT Pro is always learning, and IT Pro TV is the resource to keep your IT skills up to date with engaging and informative video tutorials. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash security now and use the code. SN30. It's time for Security Now, the show where we talk about your security online with this guy right here, the explainer in chief, Steve Gibson. Hello. Hey, Leo. Great to be with you again. It's good to have you with me. Again. Yeah, as we approach the, the end of this year, we're now in November and, uh, you know, ha Halloween passed and Thanksgiving three weeks away. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, Watching that the bubbling politics of the United States presidential election is quite, quite a, a circus, well, quite entertaining this year. All kinds of stuff happening. Today's a good day to talk about that because our good friend Drew Curtis, the founder of FARC, is running for governor of Kentucky. Today is election day. Yep. If you're in Kentucky, get on out. Actually, if you're anywhere where there's an election in the United States, and there are many uh, jurisdictions where there are, go on out and vote. And if you're in Kentucky, do yourself a favor and vote for Drew. All, all I have to say about that. Good. I have, yes. I have, I have an opinion. Actually, we had a great interview with Drew on triangulation, if you want to so know more about him. our main topic is, uh, as I promised, verifying iOS app conduct. Um, I first had behavior app behavior. I thought, no, it's really the conduct. I thought conduct is like a better word for what we're we're aiming at. And uh, and as I promised, I completely absorbed the recently released research paper uh, and came away deeply disturbed um, because Apple has essentially painted themselves into a corner um, due to the total history of the iOS platform. And uh, that'll be the topic uh, once we catch up with the news uh, and other miscellany. And this is in uh, response a, to a, a, a malware uh, threat on uh, iOS that correct. took advantage of this. Yes, there was a there was Chinese there a Chinese advertising SDK that we talked about last week, which which was found to have been used by a number of Chinese apps, and and it had behavior that the apps like that used the SDK likely did not know about because it was sending information back to that that Chinese advertising vendors servers directly, and and it was. It was doing this against Apple's rules, which meant that it had, like all of the apps which had used this software development kit as one of the, as one of the libraries for, for their own use, they all slipped past, uh, so, you know, Apple's iTunes store vetting process. And what I have learned is the vetting process is fundamentally broken and it cannot be fixed. Um, it will take it will take abandoning the wow. Objective C platform 
It it you it cannot be fixed. And and essentially they've been relying on undocumentedness, you know, obscurity, uh, in order to sort of be secure. Wow. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's kind of eye opening. So I think our listeners will find it interesting from sort of a you know a what's really going on there, and also just sort of a there's a lot of interesting sort of fundamental security lessons built into this. But we have a lot of news. Uh, there was a brief glitch in uBlock Origins. Expected availability on the Chrome Store. Uh, Symantec has screwed up certificate issuance big time. Uh, the hacking team uh, has returned. There is a Tor Messenger which just entered alpha, or I'm sorry, first beta. Uh, the U.S. and, and UK. I, let me just interject. When we talk about that, I will admit to doing something really stupid that you will laugh at with the Tor Messenger, but I will tell you about that when we cool. when we get there. Uh, the U.S. and U.K. appear to be taking diverging crypto uh, crypto and cybersecurity paths. Uh, we'll briefly cover that. JavaScript 6, or te technically ECMA, you know, ECMA script, uh, has been ratified. And I thought I'd give us a quick little peek at that. We won't go into it in depth, but boy, it's, it's acquired a bunch of new features. And it really is just sort of a mess. But for those who love it, I mean, it is the, you know, the application programming and language for browsers on the Internet, although it's got some competition coming up that we've talked about in the past. Threema has received the, the, the messaging client or messaging system has received an independent audit. Uh, we got a bunch of miscellany from from NASA and Star, Star Trek and Fargo and more. Uh, and then we will plow into the details of the corner that Apple painted themselves in on day one with uh, iOS apps. I can't wait to hear about that. That's fascinating. Before we get... <laughs> we, have a fun, we have a fun yeah, picture. Yeah, what a shocker. Um, wow. Before we get to yeah. that, let's... Uh, can I interrupt? We, yep. were, we were talking about sheets <laughs> before the show began. Let's, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I want to tell you about uh, the sheets I slept on last night. I've been sleeping on for, mm, I think, a month now. Uh, I'm not alone, by the way. I think seven U.S. presidents sleep uh, or slept on these uh, sheets. Not the, the ones I have, but the, the manufacturer is Bowl and Branch. Bowl as in Cotton Bowl, B-O-L-L, and Branch.com. Uh, this is actually a venerable uh, uh, name in uh, in bedding and linens, uh, but they're now selling direct on the in on the internet, which is awesome. Uh, and I have to say, I love them. They sell sheets. They sell towels. They're all fair trade, um, really comfortable, soft sheets. Now, sometimes you get some people like really crisp kind of linens. Um, these these are soft sheets, and it's not because of the thread count. I know you're a big fan of thread count, Steve, but I got to tell you, thread count is a kind of a marketing term. Uh, the quality of the cotton is the single most important thing. And with Ball and Branch, you are paying for the best fair trade certified organic cotton that is so soft, so lovely, you will just love it. It's not seven presidents. Three, there aren't seven living U.S. presidents, so that would be impossible. Three U.S. presidents sleep on Ball and Branch. I mean, they can afford it and have any kind of sheet they want. This is the classic. Now, because they've cut out the middlemen, they no longer sell in department stores. The markup at department stores is about 800%, so that's a good thing. Ooh. Yeah, didn't know that, did ya? Well, no. No. Wow. So that, well, you know you know how you can tell when they have like uh, huge sales and the cost of the thing is cut in half or cut by three yes. quarters and they're still making a profit. Then you and know. when they offer a, co a, a concierge service. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Who, who's paying for this? Yeah, who's paying for that? Bowl and Branch is not offering you concierge service. They're offering you the best sheets you've ever slept on. They are so incredible. I love them. You will, too. And you can try them risk-free for 30 nights. Yep, you can send them back risk-free for 30 nights. It even gets better. If you order right now, they'll give you $50 off a set of sheets and free shipping. They're really trying to get the word out about what Bowl and Branch does. By the way, this is would be a great gift I was so pleased. They came in this beautiful box with a ribbon. I mean, it was just, I thought, what did I, did I just get married? What, ha what ha is this a gift? 
and then I realized, oh, this is my new sheets. They're incredible. Variety of choices, hemmed and trimmed and banded and pleated. You get to pick, uh, but it's 100% organic, super soft, beautiful cotton. You're going to love them. $50 off now when you go to B-O-L-L, -L, like Cotton Bowl, and Branch, just like a tree branch, dot com. Use the offer code SECURITY now. B-O-L-L-A-N-D-B-R-A-N-C-H dot com. And don't forget the offer code is SECURITY now. I sleep on them. Love them. Nice. It, is a, it is a big... You know what? People, we talk about the mattresses. You were talking about darkness. I was going to say, we're pretty much getting the entire construction of your bed here it, by it, you know it, one advertiser at a time because we know what's we know what's under the sheet and now we yeah. know we know what's over the sheet yeah. now we know about the sheet itself but but it really seriously as you said this is a big part of health we're finding out oh. a good night's oh, sleep boy. is more than just having rest yeah yeah all right let's get to the uh, security so new scientist tweeted a, a picture that one of my great followers uh, forwarded to me that I got a kick out of. My my top, my caption for it was, has the Internet of Things, parens IoT, gotten out of control? And so here we see the a, a, a list of features for the smart spoon. And it's so it's uh, elegant, ergonomic design, has fingerprint recognition, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and USB connectivity, Auto syncs with other smart cutlery. Uh, you can recharge it, of course, with the spoon hub. Uh, the spoon location <laughs> is made easy with my or with Find My Spoon, the smartphone app, and you may track, download, and analyze your spoon usage with Spoon Stats. So it's like I'm sure this it will pop, be popping up on on Kickstarter any minute. It's huge. Like, the oh. new the new quantified cutlery. It's already a big deal. <laughs> oh, boy. So, um, okay. So we've talked about uBlock Origin, which is our, uh, the podcasts, or at least mine, and I know that you're using it, uh, chosen, uh, essentially, it's more than an ad blocker. It's an HTML filter because it gives us so much control over over what our browser is doing with the page it receives um, relative to other uh, domains that it, that it may or may not pull stuff from. Um, and uh, five days ago, uh, Google posted or sent a note to uBlock Origins developer who uh, goes by the handle Gorehill and will remember that I sort of has I've characterized him just based on his writings as a hybrid between like what what you would get if you merged John Dvorak and Richard Stallman, you know, uh, just sort of you know <laughs> a wow. unique character. So they so Google sends him a note uh, saying uh, to uh, your you, says dear developer your Google Chrome item you block origin with ID, and then it's got some huge random junk of lowercase uh, alphabetic stuff, which is the ID for his his uh, app in the store, did not comply with the following section of our program policies. And then they quote themselves saying, where possible, make as much of your code visible in the package as you can. If some of your app's logic is hidden and it appears to be suspicious, we may remove it. Now, Gorehill, cranky as he is, replies to this, and he posted this, he posted this on, on his GitHub uh, log or blog there, and he said, this amounts to, quote, there is somewhere one or more pieces of code I don't understand but I don't. But I won't tell you what it is. Your challenge is to find what I'm talking about and modify it so that my next review, in my next review, maybe I will understand it. <laughs> so then, some some time passes. Oh, then, and this caused a great deal of a great deal of concern that you block origin. Of course, now and understand that there's we're kind of watching this. Because we know that, you know, Google is basically funded from its advertising revenue. 
and that you block origin, one of its main benefits is it's a, an easy to use uh, ad blocking, ad controlling add-on. So there's there's some tension, we would imagine. Um, so then Google, uh, and I got a lot of tweets about this and a lot of concern that the, the, the entry uh, in, uh, in Gore Hill's posting goes on and on and on with, with people uh, upset and responding and so forth. Then Google comes back and says, Dear developer, we apologize that the update was rejected due to a snag in the review system. The updated item will be available in the Chrome store within 30 minutes. Thank you for your cooperation, Google Chrome Web Support Team. And in fact, I don't think it was ever taken down. It was never actually removed, yeah. correct. And then Gorehill finally apologizes to the list, saying, sorry for all this. That really got me worried. If this happens again, I'll wait a bit more for feedback from the Chrome store before reporting it here. Unclear, though, whether making such an issue widely known sooner than later helps with its resolution, at le or at least a faster one. So, they, I mean, there were a lot of people who apparently wrote letters to the, the Chrome development team complaining about this and saying, hey, you know, this is all on GitHub. It's all there. All you guys have to do is look at it if you really care to. So, I mean, and with, with the... One of the problems that Apple has that we'll talk about is also the problem that Chrome has is that there's a, an amazing influx of apps for Android and for uh, iOS. And so they do, they necessarily depend to a great degree on automation to do sort of first pass verification of what the apps do uh, and, and then and then somehow it falls to a team in order to look at it more closely. But boy, that's not a job I would want to have. I mean, it's, it, it's as you know, so many examples of what we've talked about over in the, through the years past have been how difficult it is to look at some code and, and determine whether it might have some, some unwanted conduct. It's just, it's just next to impossible to do that. So, so, you know, both of these ecosystems face a a a a challenge I would never want to have, and and it's one they don't have any choice but to have because they're wanting both to offer their users some guarantee of security uh, against a, a a world unlike what we've had before. I mean, you know, we never had in the Windows. Or or the Mac traditional application world, you know, we just we had the presumption that apps we installed were not going to be malicious. We had some control over them by not giving them, but by by not running our uh, ourselves and thus the apps we spawned as root. So, so what the, you know? Hopefully, the damage they could do was minimal. But generally, if something was malicious, we'd we'd remove it and let the world know as best we could. You know, but but now we're in a whole different world where apps cost a few dollars. People, you know, say, "Oh, I'll try that for a day and click on stuff." And and in fact, there was some piece of news where where thousands of apps that were free that they, it, it tied into uh, Beidou. I think I, is that is that Baidu. pronounced right? Baidu. Baidu. Yeah, the it, Chinese it, 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 search engine. Exactly. It was it was apps that free apps that they were making that had some unwanted conduct, and them being free was part of the hook. It was because I mean, who's not going to get something that's free? Uh, unfortunately, it, they were misbehaving themselves. So, boy, I mean, it it is a it, it, it's a it's a big problem, and I. I don't see how we solve it. Um, you know, the, the thing to, I, I loved in this whole Gore Hill thing was the way you interpret this very much had to do with your opinion of Google. Like if, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it, yep. it confirmed everybody's firm, fir firmly held belief that Google's evil. <laughs> if you had that firmly held belief. Right. Um, and I think it's completely possible that, that that's true. But I think it's also very possible that it literally just was a bug. It spat out what was essentially an incomprehensible email, which kind of lends leads me to think it was was a bug, and they fixed it. Um, and yeah. that happens all the time. It happens on Apple Store as well. 
So it doesn't yeah, have to be malfeasance for this to have happened. Correct. I agree. And it might well be that like this was the automated phase right. and that most people who are trying to push something creepy through they they just oh well okay that didn't work and they and they're never heard heard from again and so it might be that you know good apps that should not be denied there may be a false positive rate and when that happens if the the developer stands up for himself and says hey wait a minute you know this should there well, you know what's going on then that escalates it to the next level of of examination. Someone looks at it and goes, "Oh yeah, that was you know we didn't mean to reject that. Sorry, oopsies." You know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Google has taken a a what has surprised the industry with the strength of their response. Although I I can't say that I think it's it's over the top. Um, and that is that uh, Google has declared that they're basically putting Symantec, one of the major um, security certificate uh, uh, certificate authorities, uh, after they bought they bought Verisign, right? Yeah. Um, and Verisign was like you know I was once upon a time using Verisign. Me too. I left, that was the one, I, right? Yeah, th exactly. And I mean I happily escaped to Digicert where I'm way happier. Um, anyway, so 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 here's the to get a sense for what has upset Google. Um, back in a little after the middle of last month, or actually no, now we're in November. So it was it was mid it was September 18th. So maybe what six weeks ago. Symantec, in a rather clueless blog, I mean, they. I, I looked at the title of it after I knew what their behavior had been. They, 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 they titled it "A Tough Day as Leaders." And I thought, oh, <laughs> oh you God, jerks. get Jerky. over, get over yourselves. You don't really but, want to combine an apology with <laughs> a boast at the same exactly. time. They don't really go together. Exactly, and you didn't build this; you bought it. You know, yeah. so, Jeez. you know, they bought VeriSign. So, yeah, a tough day as leaders. It's like, okay. Please. So, so they say, we learned on Wednesday that a small number of test certificates were inappropriately issued internally this week for three, three. Now, listen to these numbers because this comes back to bite them, <laughs> bite them bad. Three domains during product testing. All of these test certificates and keys were always within our control and were immediately revoked when we discovered the issue. There was no direct impact to any of the domains and never any danger to the Internet. Further, we are in the process of proactively notifying the domain owners and our major partners. In light of these events, we must reassert our commitment to stand behind our values and our position as a trusted industry leader. While our processes and approach are based on the industry best practices that we helped create, uh, we have immediately put in place additional processes and technical controls to eliminate the possibility of human error. We will continue to relentlessly evolve these best practices to ensure something like this does not happen again. In addition, okay, now, and this contradicts what they just said. In addition, we discovered that a few outstanding employees, I don't know if they meant outstanding in the sense that they were outstanding employees. <laughs> They're outstanding they, in the unemployment line, they, I hope. Ex <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That a few outstanding employees, meaning that at that time they still were, <laughs> who had who had successfully undergone our stringent onboarding to create some yuppie verb. God, I hate that. Oh. I know our stringent onboarding and security trainings failed to follow our policies, despite. Their best intentions, okay, how does that work? This failure to follow policies has led to their termination after a thoughtful review process. 
What, their best please. efforts not to get fired? Please don't please sue don't fire us. me, please. I don't want to. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Because you rely on us to protect the digital world. Yes. Parents, which we helped create. The entire I, I, world. I, I put that in there. Yes. We hope we hold ourselves to a no compromise oh, bar well, that's really for such breaches. Yes. As a result, it was the only call we could make. Ah. Boo-hoo. Okay. As much as we hate to lose valuable colleagues, oh, they were more than employees. <laughs> after their after their onboarding, they Please became valuable <laughs> became valuable <laughs> colleagues. We are the industry leader in online safety and security, and it is imperative that we maintain the absolute highest standards. At the end of the day, we hang our hats on trust, and that trust is built by doing what we say we're going to do. Well, our hats must be on the floor by now. <laughs> Jeez, this is the worst. Okay, so remember, this was a tough day as leaders. Tough days as leaders. Is this? Yes. Now, now over at Google, somebody was spitting their coffee out, uh, and his name is Ryan Sleevy. Um, he he blogged Wednesday. He said, and I have the link in the notes. He said, following our notification. Symantec published a report in response to our inquiries and disclosed that 23 test certificates had been issued within the domain without the domain owner's knowledge covering five organizations including Google and Opera. However, we were still able to find several more questionable certificates using only the certificate transparency logs and a few minutes of work. Uh. We shared these results with other root store operators on October 6th to allow them to independently assess and verify our research. Symantec performed another audit and on October 12th, announced that they had found an additional 164 certificates. Well, it's close to three. <laughs> <laughs> it's close. It's within an order of magnitude. <laughs> over 76 domains <sighs> and 2,458 certificates issued for domains that were never registered. It's obviously concerning that a certificate authority would have such a long-running issue and that they would be unable to assess its scope after being alerted to it and conducting an audit. Therefore, we are firstly going to require that as of June 1st, 2016, so... They get seven months, eight really, all certificates issued by Symantec itself will be required to support certificate transparency, meaning that everything they issue is logged publicly. In this case, logging of non-EV certificates would have provided significantly greater insight into the problem and may have allowed the problem to be detected sooner. After this date, certificates newly issued by Symantec that do not conform to the Chromium Certificate Transparency Policy may result in interstitials or other problems when used in Google products. So this is an unprecedented slap saying essentially that Symantec, the leaders <laughs> of the industry, behaved so badly in, in taking responsibility after notification that they can no longer be trusted. And we're going to require that, that 
every certificate they subsequently issue is publicly noticed and we and we're going to verify it and and we're and Chrome the browser will essentially blacklist any certificate that that VeriSign slash slash Symantec issues which it which we have not first been notified of of the issuance of by Symantec. So I mean, and I don't think again, I don't think that's too much to ask. You know, we've we we've seen certificate authorities make mistakes, and everyone acknowledges that while they can be bad, what what a CA has to do is respond responsibly. And and in general, you know, that's what we that's the only thing we ask for from anyone. You know, when 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 Joe at last pass found some scary network activity. It was his response to that, which was, 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 you know, more than adequate and immediate, you know, saying, we don't even know if there was a breach, but something, we don't understand why there was this much network activity on someone's workstation when he wasn't there. So we're going to err on the side of caution. Similarly, a certificate authority has to say, oh my God, immediately do an audit and absolutely come clean saying, okay, thank you for catching this. This is what we found. They're all canceled. They're revoked. We've pushed out revocation. You know, we're, we're doing everything we can. I mean, that's what you want. What Symantec did is, is cannot be understood because they, they initially said, and in their public pronouncement of their grandiosity, they said, oh, yeah, we found three test certificates that never were used publicly, never happened, blah, blah, blah. And then it's thousands. So sorry, Symantec, you've, you know, you've lost the trust. And um, uh, and anything you do after June 1st, 2016 for for some length of time is going to have to be, you know, you're going to have to every single certificate you issue, you know, you you notify so and oh, and that's wow. not just not just EV, but also non extended validation certs. So does that put them is, out of the business, is, or I mean, no, it, no, no, it won't put them out of business. But uh, it it, uh, it it it's just sort of it, it's a it's a it's a conduct slap. It's saying we do we do not feel we can trust you based on your behavior. Your behavior is. The only thing that that a CA has, I mean, that's you know, it's it's their it's their policies, their their and their operational security that that uh, that we must trust because all of our clients are trusting all of the certificates that any of the CVs issue. There, and this is the weakness of of the entire. Uh, public key infrastructure as we have it today is that it's it's we're trusting all these all these individual entities and every single one of them must never make a mistake well that's that's a weak system it's the best we've been able to come up with so far but it's it's accident prone and so when an accident does happen and then and then from like a major certificate authority that's issuing a ton of certificates. Cause as we said, you know, VeriSign was, you know, they were always my certificate authority until they just got so annoying that I, I went in search of an alternative. So yikes. Uh, yeah, not, and you know, <laughs> a tough day for the leaders. Yeah. Okay. It's a mad deck. Uh, <laughs> Hard to be a leader. I'll tell you. Oh yeah. I've got a few arrows. Uh, so the hacking team is back. We'll remember that about four months ago, uh, a hacker known only as Phineas Fisher, as I, he identified himself, hacked into the hacking team uh, and put 400 gig of their previously private internal data, including emails, customer lists, and the source code of their their proprietary RCS, their ba basically a remote access Trojan, a rat, uh, they called it RCS, remote control system. Um, and their, you know, their customer list showed that U.S. law enforcement was, you know, FBI, NSA, CIA, DEA under, 
uh, uh, under sort of shell cor uh, corporations were were actively buying this technology in as part of their cyber uh, efforts. So, and of course, we also discovered a bunch of zero days that were completely unknown. It took a while because 400 gigs of data is like a you know it, it you're drowning in wealth there but what we found was you know flash zero days uh, like a bunch of them uh, and and some some windows zero days so these are things that they were leveraging themselves and or selling to others for their own use so this was a massive black eye for for this group and it's taken them now about four months on the on the 19th um, a couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago, rather, um, their CEO, David uh, uh, Vincenzetti, wrote to a to their mailing list, which, by the way, we have. We know everybody's on it. We know everything. Um, he, he wrote, most law enforcement agencies in the U.S. and abroad will become blind. They will go dark. They will simply be unable to to fight vicious phenomena such as terrorism. Only the private companies can help here. We are one of them. It is crystal clear, he writes, that the present American administration does not have the stomach to oppose the American IT conglomerates and to approve unpopular yet totally necessary regulations. So, th so that's, he, that he is saying, you know, Apple and Google and, and others are being allowed to have un undecryptable end-to-end -end encryption. And so he's saying that you, he's, and then this is, this is a, a newsletter out to their customer base, basically, to, you know, global, law enforcement and governments and others who who have purchased from them in the past he's saying look you need our stuff um so it's uh so the hacking team is quote finalizing brand new and totally unprecedented cyber investigation solutions and what has been reported sort of in in the fog surrounding this is that some companies are remaining others are, are are reconsidering whether they want to have an affiliation with this group because you know basically they their past affiliation was outed and that hurts and they don't want to stay there so uh anyway uh, i think you know these guys are no doubt going to have to uh build up another re repository of of attack vectors uh, unfortunately they really do appear to have skills. You know, they had a treasure trove of, of, of amazing goodies that no one knew about in, in the public uh, and that they were no doubt, um, you know, leveraging into some serious cash flow for themselves. So that got lost. Uh, and, of course, as all those zero days were found, we, the, the industry was patching them as fast as they were dug out of that 400 gigabyte data dump. Um, they're going to need some more, but that's apparently what they're working on. Um, and, and unfortunately there is arguably a place for them. I mean, we, we do want, we as users and, and companies wanting to offer security, we want truly non backdoored, non broken in any way, end to end encryption. What that means is that that law, it'll, law enforcement will be forced to insert shims into systems to get, to, to get in before the encryption is applied. Because the data in transit, uh, unless there, there is a way to, for a third party to you know, crack that by altering keys or, 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 or something, I mean, it's not beyond the realm, but you know, in terms of like the, 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 the weakest point of attack is the computer that is sending or receiving it before it gets encrypted and after it gets decrypted. And, and there, your classic model is go get a warrant, 
in order to get legal authority to infect some sus suspect's machine with something that allows law enforcement that kind of shim. And so I think that's the way we're going to see it evolve. That means that, though, this is highly specialized. And so that's not skills that the FBI typically has. So it makes sense for there be for there to be an underworld, you know, third party company with the expertise to then sell that capability to to law enforcement that under court order uh, is able to use it. I, I think that's this I, is this, I think that's the model. This is not the only company doing this. There must be other agencies. Right. Other, other groups offering right. these kinds of skills. Well, yeah, and I mean, it is. I, you could see how it would it would appeal to a certain class of of skilled hacker. They they find defects in commercial products, and of course, we know that that's happening all the time. All the, you know, all of the hacking uh, competitions are always breaking all of the browsers one way or another. So this can be done. And, you know, there, Adobe Flash is constantly being patched. It's not like it stopped being patched. It's always being fixed, right. you know, as is Windows. So, you know, we have very complex systems that that can, that have not yet been secured. So uh, it does. And, and, and so I guess my point is that I, I don't even view that as necessarily nefarious, oh. depending upon who they sell their their shims to. If they sell it to law enforcement, and assuming that law enforcement acts responsibly, legally, essentially constitutionally, and gets a search warrant, then, then, then I'll actually like that because it takes pressure off of the end-to-end -end encryption right. pro system that we want to have by allowing law enforcement a, you know, a legal means of achieving what they what they want to break encryption for but not by breaking encryption, by getting in before the encryption. So, Tor Messenger, you had a, a, a well, something uh, interesting? So I, like you, when they announced this, I said, oh, yeah, and I took a look at it. And uh, one of the things that they offer, <laughs> I installed it, one of the things they offer is to be the... Um, the routing for um, more mainstream messenger services. So they support XMPP and Jabber. And I noted Facebook Messenger, and I thought, well, this would be kind of cool. Right. I mean, obviously, Facebook would still know Even everything you're doing. And Google Chat, which is uh, used to be Jabber, XMPP. So right. Facebook would know, uh, but, but, but no intermediary would know. And so nobody could spy on your Facebook Messenger, which would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So I installed it, and I uh, uh, clicked the button that said Connect Facebook. And I logged in, and it didn't work, probably because I have two-factor, and it wasn't. It didn't have a way of accommodating two-factor. Ah, right. Then later in the day, uh, I got an urgent message from Facebook on my Facebook page saying, somebody has tried to log into your Facebook account from Egypt. We've disabled your Facebook account, and you, you, you know, we won't let you back until you change your password. And stupidly, I just freaked out, and I went, oh, no, and I tweeted about it. I said, you know, I'm worried somebody that Tor Messenger isn't completely... Uh, secure. And then, of course, immediately I got tweets back saying, you dimwit. <laughs> That's how Tor works. That was you from Egypt. And I went, oh, <laughs> never mind. So that is one, and of course, I love that's a great that's a great anecdote. Yeah, though. Facebook's yeah. not prepared for that, so Facebook said, well, and I just believe, I went, I wasn't very, I wasn't very critical in my thinking, and I said, oh, no. Uh, and change my password and all that. Yeah, it's it's what so, Tor does. So yeah, so what Tor Messenger is, which is had just has just entered beta, is as is a a combination of Tor for anonymity and OTR. That's the off the record chat protocol. I, and that's and I liked that. I thought that's yes, cool. it is. It's absolutely, uh, it's it's public, publicly vetted. It's been checked several times. It, that that's a win. So so the combination makes a lot of sense. And and Tor I think makes sense for chat because you're not trying to do you know web surfing 
where you where as we know a web page goes out to 50 other domains and right. sucks stuff in from all over you're just sending a you know a a couple of hundred characters of chat you know it takes back a little longer no big deal yeah, exactly a little bit of a little bit of latency in a chat doesn't matter so anyway i wanted to put it on everybody's radar while it's in beta you know it's like okay we'll we'll just kind of keep an eye on it and we'll see how it goes but I know that for some class of our listeners, uh, they may want to know and may want to start playing with it. Yeah, you know, and don't try to hook up your Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, Tor is well established, and and OTR is well established. So, I mean, it's not like there's anything hugely new they've done. I imagine that the only problems they would have are, are things, for example, like needing to support two factor uh, right. if the you know. If you're trying to connect to that and and so forth, and good on Facebook, so, I love it that they said, "Oh, yes. somebody's logging in from Egypt." I don't think you're in Egypt since you logged in this morning from somewhere from, you know, Petaluma, so it yep. must be a phony login. And from yep. from their point of view, it, it seemed like it was sure. Yeah, <laughs> I just feel so we I have, feel kind of dumb. Oh, I, no, I love that's a great it's a great anecdote. That's, yeah. that's was, don't you know how Tor works? And I said, "Oh, yeah." <laughs> So uh, we have two divergent uh, directions which cyber products or cybersecurity are taking. In the U.S., the EFF Thursday posted the, the word victory uh, with the, the subhead State Department decides not to classify cyber products as munitions. <laughs> Now, okay. I'm surprised that's still on the on the table. I know, aren't you? It's like, wait a minute. We have we not been here before. You know, it's because crypto was once declared a munition that we're having problems today because weak crypto is right. still available in some browsers and servers, which would never be there if it weren't deliberately that's a, crip, crippled. That's a good point. I didn't really. Of course, that's why they're twenty whatever is 24 bit keys are they're out there right right and they right. and it's they and they call it munitions just to give it export restrictions that's the point. precisely precisely and so so once upon a time strong encryption was classified by the state department as a munition and you could not export it from the u.s and so of course the problem was we the internet is global and so so the only the only solution that Netscape had when they were trying to do secure connections, because remember they did SSL version one, was okay. Uh, 128 bit keys. The State Department of all things says we cannot use on a connection leaving the country, but 40 bits we can, and that's where 40 bits came from. Uh. Was that it was because it's crackable. It <laughs> yes, because the NSA was, you know, if they really needed to, could could get into it. But and, and back then, with computing resources and so forth, forty was strong. But you know, mostly it was yeah, it it kept casual people from from getting in. Uh, one hundred twenty eight is what you really wanted. I mean, one hundred twenty eight is even strong today still. So. Okay, so anyway, this so the, 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 this little blurb is just a, a two sentences. Reads this week, the U.S. Department of State's Defense Trade Advisory Group, you know, DTAG, met to decide whether to classify cyber products, and those are in quotes because that's going to sort of ill-defined, whether to, to classify cyber products as munitions placing them in the same export control regime as hand grenades and fighter planes. Thankfully, common sense won out, writes the EFF, and DTAG recommended that cyber products not be added to the control list. That's the good news. The bad news is that the UK hasn't gotten there yet. Of course not. Now, I'm not I want to make it clear this is proposed and needs to go through parliament yet but is being strongly pushed by David Cameron. So, the uh the the headline is internet firms to be banned from offering unbreakable encryption under new laws. Um 
companies such as Apple, Google, and others will no longer to be will no longer be able to offer encryption so advanced that even they cannot decipher it when asked to under the this is called the investigatory powers bill. It will also require internet companies to retain web browsing history of their customers, meaning ISPs would be required to retain web browsing history for up to a year. The bill is expected to face a tough route through Parliament. But Mr. Cameron, and, and, and I'm quoting from the telegraph.co.uk, but Mr. Cameron urged critics to back the measures. He told ITVs this morning, quote, as prime minister, I would just say to people, please, not, let's not have a situation where we give terrorists, criminals, child abductors safe places to communicate. It's not a safe space for them to communicate on a fixed line telephone or a mobile phone. We shouldn't allow the Internet to be a safe space for them to communicate and do bad things. And then Lord Carlisle, who is the, for the former terrorism laws watchdog, said there had been a, a lot of or a lot, a quote, lot of demonization of the police and security services over their intentions for such information. He was quoted saying, I think it is absurd to suggest the police and the security services have a kind of casual desire to intrude on the privacy of the innocent. They have enough difficulty finding the guilty. No one has produced any evidence of casual curiosity on part of the security services. What about malicious well, curiosity? <laughs> what about of course, <laughs> political curiosity? What about yes, that? yes, exactly. And actually, Edward Snowden did provide right. anecdotal evidence. Remember, he was talking about nude photos of passed people around being and, yeah. passed around the NSA that, you know, that they were sucking off the Internet from their taps. So, so I mean, this is, you know, it's expected to have a, a tough road through Parliament, but I, I mean, I don't know what this means. If, if they were to pass this, then Apple and Google have a big decision to make. And... And then I don't know how ISPs can even honor web browsing history unless their certificates are forced into users' clients so that the unencrypted traffic goes through the ISP for logging. So, I mean, this has huge ramifications. I mean, maybe it just, you know, it's like a nightmare. Um <laughs> I, 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 you know, in terms of practical implementation. Apparently you know? it's not. Uh, by the way, this debate is going on in the House of Lords, which makes it even more anachronistic <laughs> and funny. Apparently it's not a done deal. Uh, Lord Strasburger <laughs> claimed the prime minister does not seem to get the need for strong encryption standards with no backdoor access. The Lord said, Cameron said three times he intends to ban any communication we cannot read. Will the minister bring the prime minister up to speed with the realities of the digital world? And then uh, Lord Clement Jones asked if she could absolutely... Oh, my God, it goes on. And then there's the Baroness, <laughs> Baroness Shields. There she is, lovely lady, I'm sure. Uh, she says, I can confirm there is no intention to do that. That is correct. So, I don't know. Uh, he did not, to do to do what? I mean, they're, they're on one hand, what they're saying is, I know I mean, that this bill says that we need to be able to see everything on the internet. I there know. needs to be nothing that we can't see, and we're even going to make ISPs log their customers' browsing history for a year. She said, the Baroness said. She could absolutely confirm there's no intention in forthcoming legislation either to weaken encryption or provide back doors. She said, even though he said it three times, the prime minister does not advocate banning encryption. Oh, banning encryption. Oh, well, I'm glad he doesn't advocate ah, that. Okay, we can, you can still have it as long as we can, too. <laughs> he doesn't want to ban encryption. 
Uh, you know, I think that part of the problem is the lords and ladies do not seem to understand what the hell they're talking about. Well, and and to our to our government and bureaucracy's credit, uh, the you know, and frankly to the the crypto industry in the U.S., who independently wrote several you know mass signed explanations and white papers and explainers and pleas you know to to make it clear that it what what law enforcement wanted was not possible not just inconvenient not possible and and so you know maybe i i hope that there are similar levels of activism over in the uk uh and that 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 will happen because boy i i just don't know I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like from a practical standpoint, what does that mean? You can't use a VPN? Yeah. Because a, v- sure. a user using a VPN would send an encrypted tunnel past the ISP, making it impossible for the ISP to log what the user does. So what does that mean? Yeah. I, I, uh, wow. Anyway, interesting times we live in. Mm. It seems like it's the 18th century, actually. <laughs> With oh. The Baroness and the Lord. <laughs> Let's take a break. All I'm right. Catch my <laughs> Breathe breath. deep. It's Audible time. I'm just browsing through. You know, I love it when I get new Audible credits. And uh, are, are you taking a nap? Would you like to take a nap? <laughs> no, I'm just... Please. I'm just <laughs> oh, poor just guy. He's got a crick in his neck right from in. all this trying to figure out what the hell they're talking it's, about. It's the tension. It's the tension ah. of this. Well, relax and listen to a great audio, both unless unless it's uh, Stephen King's Bazaar of Bad Dreams, in which case it will not be relaxing. It will scare you to death. Um, I love Stephen King. He's, you know, when I first came to Audible, and I, I've been an Audible member since 2000, for 15 years now, they didn't have any Stephen King, and I hated that. Now they got it all. And this is what I love about Audible. They know what we want to hear, what we want to read. When I first came to Audible, they didn't have much science fiction either. Now, thanks to the Audible Frontiers series, they're actually going back and recording classic science fiction. So it's all there. The selection at audible.com is phenomenal. Now more than 180,000 titles, all the new ones, but lots of classics. For instance, the Raymond Chandler classic, The Big Sleep. <gasps> Love all the Philip Marlowe novels. Wouldn't that be fun? Because when you listen, you're, it's like you're watching a movie. In your mind, it's incredible. These, by the way, are daily deals, so they're very uh, affordable. But I'm going to tell you how you can get a book for free. That ought to make you make you pretty happy. The new Nora Roberts is out. My wife loves Nora Roberts. Star Wars Battlefront. This is a the companion novel to go with the new video game, the new uh, multi you know multiplayer online role playing game, Star Wars Battlefront. Twilight Company. There are lots of Star Wars novels. And the thing is, when they when they bring these, uh, when they audible, audible records these, they bring them to life. Many of these are multicast recordings, so there's a performance in there. Um, oh, I just love this stuff. And then you get lots of superstars uh, reading these, too. Uh, oh, they just did a new version of George L. Orwell's 1984, narrated by one of my favorite narrators, Simon Preble. Listen to this guy. Talk about a great... Voice. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. Oh, yes. There was, of course... Oh, yes. Or oh, Animal Farm. Yes. Or oh, Fahrenheit 451. Tim Robbins narrates that one. Look, here's the deal. If you go to Audible... Let me make sure I get this right here. Audiblepodcast.com slash security now. You'll be signing up for the gold account. That means you're going to get, it's a subscription, which I recommend. You know, you can buy buy them a la carte, but if you get a subscription, you get a better deal. And I guarantee you, a book a month, that's nothing. You're going to go through that crazy. Oh, Glenn Johns has a new book. He's the guy who recorded all the Rolling Stones and the Who and the Led Zeppelin albums. He was, oh, man, he engineered Abbey Road. Oh, I'm listening. Oh, oh putting this in my wish list because I just used up my two credits. Oh, I'll tell you. This is the fun part about being an Audible subscriber. You go to audible.com, and it's like going to the best bookstore in the world. Your first book's free. The hard part is choosing it. James Franco's narration of Slaughterhouse-Five, one of the great books of all time. That's brand new. 
audiblepodcast.com slash security now. Get the gold account. That's a book a month. Cancel any time in that first month. But uh, you'll pay nothing, but that book will be yours to keep forever. If, if I look at my library, I was just going through my library. I'm going to post my library on my uh, blog because people, well, you know, there's a lot of interest in the books we recommend and the books I've read and so forth. And I'll put the entire library, and it's huge and it's long, on my, uh, on my blog. And you can see all the books I've read. And, that's, and these are all still available to me, which I love. Uh, and frankly, uh, sometimes I get busy. I don't get to listen to them all. I can go back and do that anytime. Audiblepodcast.com slash security now. Your first book's free. It won't be your last. I pretty much guarantee it. We thank Audible for their long and continued support of this show and all the shows we do on the Twit Network. So uh, back to business. We have a another another clever way of tracking users or their browsers. And, you know, the, the problem is that sophisticated systems, as we often say, are so difficult to secure. Um, of course, there was the super cookie uh, where it didn't just use the, the cookies that your browser was sending to specific websites, but it, it looked at all of the headers and realized that things like the user agent contained a long list of, of subassemblies and subsystems and, and their version numbers that your particular system had and that, that, that hugely narrowed down the number of people you might be. And then you couple that with a few other things, like even the, the order of the headers. It turns out different makes of browser have their request headers. They emit the, the request headers, each of them in a unique sequence. So, oh, whoop, now we know, you know, that, that narrows it down again. And through, through a series of that, you can end up really figuring out to some degree who someone is then so that was one example then remember there was the the visited link hack where because browsers are are trying to help their users they color the links which have been previously visited differently than they color the links that haven't been well someone figured out hey that could be leveraged in order to probe a user to see what their browsing habits have been by by off the page putting up some links letting the browser color them and then checking the color so it was like whoops that was something we didn't anticipate so now we have another one and this is an hsts cache state hack so okay what is that S -H -S -H -S -T -S, we've talked about, is the HTTP strict transport secrecy or strict transport security. Now, that's the thing that, for example, GRC does and Google does and other security conscious sites do where, we're, where the entire site is committed to being over TLS only accessible via HTTPS, only accessible securely. So, so every response that, that those sites, like mine and others, give includes an, S, an HSTS header, a strict transport security header, saying absolutely never try to access this site non-securely. And if you encounter an HTTP URL to this domain, you have our permission to, to silently upgrade it to HTTPS. Now, the, the, the reason for this is there was one little hole in the security of a site. And that is the first page. Um, and we've talked about this in the past. If, for example, you were in a public Wi-Fi setting and you first went to HTTP colon slash slash Amazon.com, then 
that first page would be over HTTP. When it came back to you, that all of the links might be converted to HTTPS, or your browser might even be redirected by that site to HTTPS, so that it's trying to take you, the, the remote server is trying to say, oh, you came in non-secure, let's move you over to secure. Or, you know, buttons on a form might be HTTPS. The point is, because it was coming back in the clear, a man in the middle could strip out the S's and keep the site from switching to secure. Then the user, just assuming that the security of his login has been taken care of by the site, as we all assume, types in his username and password, which the bad guy then gets because the form has had the S stripped out of its submission URL. So it goes username and password in the clear. And now we have a problem. Now your identity for that site has been lost. So the, 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 the problem here is that first query. And so the HSTS solution was a fix for that first query problem because the idea being every single contact with the site sends back only you, you have you, the browser, were giving you permission, upgrade this to, to HTTPS. That way, oh, and I, I forgot to mention, there's an expiration, which is typically way in the future, you know, like ye a year in the future. So not only does every reply to the browser reinforce that, but the browser caches that. Okay. A clever person figured out how to probe the cache in a browser. That is, how to determine which sites a user has been to. And with a large enough set of probes with a very high degree, you can again identify a user. So this thing is called Sniffly. Uh, if anyone wants to dig deeper into it, I've got the, the various links in the show notes. But the concept is that you, you visit a site that presents you, the, the, so you visit a site, your browser says, give me this page. The page contains a whole bunch of accesses to HTTP images, that is non-secure images, and something, it also leverages something called the content security policy. The content security policy is another of sort of the evolving moves to, to further strengthen the whole, the whole client server web interaction. So what it does is it's able to, it specifies rules which the browser must follow for its queries. And normally you're saying, like for example, a, a, a typical content security policy would be, uh, would be only access JavaScript, so like star.js over HTTPS. So it would prevent the browser from, from ever following a non-secure JavaScript link. So that, that's an example. Well, similarly, it's possible to use content security policy to say only access images over HTTP. So what that does is, is it, it, blocks the, it blocks the browser from sending an HTTPS query for an image. Then when the, the probing site sends a bunch of image requests to known HT, uh, HSTS sites, the, the state of the browser's HSTS cache will upgrade those that are in the cache to HTTPS. The, the problem is that, that that runs then against the content security policy which, which blocks the loading 
of images other than HTTP. So what this all boils down to is the JavaScript that's also running on the page is timing the failure of the image fetch. It will either, it will either uh, be blocked instantly in like less than a microsecond, which says that it has been blocked because that browser has an HSTS entry in its cache, which upgraded that query, which has then been blocked. Or if it doesn't have an HSTS entry, the query will be made out over the internet, which takes many tens of milliseconds. And so simply what this ball boils down to is simply by timing the the, the length of time it takes for the, for the query to fail, it's possible to sense the presence of an item in the, in, in the browser's HSTS cache. And in fact, there's a test page um, that I have uh, that, that is on that, that Sniffly link that, bring, that comes up and shows you where you have been and where you have probably not been. And as I looked at it, it's like, oh, yeah, uh, it's pretty right about that. So an interesting hack. Now, it's, I mean, it is, it, it's not something to get all worked up about. For one thing, um, it only works on HSTS supporting uh, browsers. Um, uh, the, uh, there are some other caveats, too. It's not supported yet in Safari, IE, or Chrome on iOS, if you had the HTTPS Everywhere extension, remember what that does is that auto-promotes all queries. It tries them secure first and then falls back if that fails. Well, that would defeat this completely. That would mess up the results. Um, it doesn't work reliably over the Tor browser just because of the latency. It's unable to to at, to to properly make the um, the the differentiation one way or the other. And now, so Leo, you're, 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 th there it is. There's results on the left-hand side. It's funny to tell place, you where I haven't, probably haven't been. Right, right. Because what, 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 what it's done is it's sent probes to those known HSTS servers, but it's detected that you don't, your browser doesn't have a, an HSTS from that site. Ah, so you probably haven't been there. I don't know yeah, if I've so, been to this, all of these sites it's telling me I've been to. Is yeah, this just and, and for it, this machine and this browser? Yes, that one instance yeah. of that browser. And yeah. it, it does seem wrong. I mean, I, I, I noticed I don't even know it, what some of these sites are. Qlinks.com, Attracta.com. I don't think right. I've ever been to those. Right. So it's it's not. I, not I'm perfect. not I'm not all worked up over it. It was an interesting proof of concept. A lot of, of these are right, but there's a yeah. few I don't. Gumroad.com. Yeah. Have I ever been there? I don't think so. Could they be ad networks? No, Gum Road is sell your work directly to your audience. I have never been this this site. That so. is a good point, though. Uh, if whoever it was in the background who suggested, servers. yeah, that's John. Yeah. Yes, because yeah, exactly. Your browser making third party queries, it will be acquiring those too. So so yeah. you didn't go there, but it went behind your back. Right. And we know how much of that goes on. Yep. So, ECMA Script Six. Um, this is the first major update to JavaScript, as we conventionally and, and conveniently call it, uh, since 09. So it's been six years since, we, since we've had so-called ES or ECMAScript 5 or the current version of JavaScript. Um, uh, the ECMAScript 6 was ratified in June of... 2015, so a few months ago, um, browsers are moving forward. There, there's a cool link down on, uh, on my show notes, Leo. You might want to bring it up with yours uh, under that transpilation, as it's called. It's translation and compilation. Transpilation is the term that they use. Uh, and now, now the far left column is it's it's just probed your browser, so it says current browser. And so what, we, what, what what we're seeing there is varying shades of green or red for the levels of support 
of these new features in the in in various industry standard browsers and and by the way there's one almost all green column i was very impressed it's edge edge is the leading browser in the industry I mean, I mean, compared to Chrome, which has been a standards leader, uh, and and Firefox, and of course IEs in uh, down in the weeds somewhere, but uh, uh, that that's the that's an almost all green column. There is I'm pointing to the screen. It's like that's not going to help. Uh, is Edge uh, and and as far does a, a you know a fair job. Okay, so what's new? I'm not going to go into a comprehensive. Uh, uh, enumeration of features because anybody who really cares will care about more detail than it's that it makes sense for me to give but for example um in javascript uh unless you declare a variable it is way global it's it's, it's if you just use a variable without declaring it it's just it's known to everybody everywhere uh you know in the running script the normal way of limiting that is to use the 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 var v a r verb so you'd say var x equals something and that would that the the so-called scope the 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 scope of code where that's known is limited to the, to the function where that variable was declared with var um you can declare you can explicitly declare global variables by by using var outside of any function in which case everybody gets to know about it the new addition is the word let which you know harkens back to basic <laughs> where you had let x equals and two lisp yep mm -hmm. yep uh though you know the very old languages they use let well what let does is very handy because it allows for local block scoping, right. meaning that that like within curly braces <laughs> or you know just within the in, the containing block in the list that in the list world we have a saying, what happens within let stays within let. <laughs> so right. only stuff within the let block it, it can see that variable, which means right. you can duplicate a, va a variable and with no harm. Which is not nice. correct. Yeah, correct. And, and and in fact, that's actually where it comes in handy. Oftentimes, programmers, because they don't have very tightly locally sco scoped variables, they're having to use like you know i j k l m n. Right. Even you know in 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 are, other areas of their code, whereas they it it would be cleaner just to like reuse i if you if you if if you had containment of the, of your C use has of local. i i mean i think most languages handle this in some way but the problem is javascript well, well what's frankly. happening is yeah what happens scoping in javascript what, is it, terrible if we were to it, it's it's awful but uh, if we were to to sort of stand back and take a, a 10,000 foot view of the of this 6 year evolution what we're seeing is bits and pieces are being pulled in from an array of existing languages. So for the first time, there's a, an enforce constant declaration where you can declare a variable to be a constant and you are unable to change it. That hasn't existed before. It was up to you not to change it, but it, nothing enforced its, its, its fixed value. Uh, we get a bunch of handy new methods, you know, operations for the math uh, string and array uh, objects. Uh, there's now a support for default function parameters, which a lot of other languages have had. The idea being that in the function declaration, you could say, okay, I want this function to take values, you know, X, Y, and Z. But if the caller doesn't specify them, then let's have Y be 12 and Z be you know, hello. And so uh, it was in Java until now, it was awkward to do that. You'd have to, do, you'd have to say this function takes X, Y, and Z. And then in code, you'd have to check to see if Y was undefined and if Z was undefined. And if they were equal to the undefined value, then you'd set them to your default which is, you know, I mean, it does the job, but it's awful and cumbersome. And so they said, hey, you know, other other languages have 
default values for function parameters. Let's put them in Java. So now Java gets that, which is nice. Um, there's a, uh, uh, we've, uh, it also gets formal support for modules, which is a huge win. There's been, there's been no explicit uh, module containment. The idea with a, that concept of a module is that, that the stuff inside isn't public, but you're able to export explicit things from that you want to make public. Otherwise, uh, the, the work you're doing inside is private. And then you are able to import from other code functions that that, that code has exported for your use. So it's it, it, there's like more you have to do. You don't have to do this. So it's not like it, it, you're you're required to do it. So JavaScript you know, remains easy to use, but the problem is ease of use begins to collide with doing big things. And people are increasingly wanting to do big things. And so, for example, if you've got, if, if your project has a whole bunch of different code pulling in from different directions and the variables are all global, if any of that code uses the same variable name, they clobber each other. So there's there's all kinds of problems as things get bigger, which people have come up with clever uh, solutions for. There, there, there's something called closures in JavaScript, which is a really bizarre way of, of encapsulating everything in a big function in order to get func use the function's locality to extend to all of the code. But it's just, it's really cumbersome. So these are additional nice extensions. Um, also, from, uh, from classic object-oriented uh, uh, languages, we get, cons a f we get a formal object constructor and methods. So user-defined objects can have a constructor, which is invoked when a new instance of that object is created, and then it's able to have contained methods which, it, which that object can export. And those are now formal parts of the language. So you, so you create an instance using the new verb, um, and then that runs construction code um, of your own design. And you have now inheritance from classes. So we actually have formal classes in, in JavaScript 6 or ECMAScript 6. Uh, and you are able to reach back and, and, and access things in the, in the base class. So, um, so what, what's happening is... Uh, current browser support is spotty, yet many companies are wanting to start using these features. So there are a number of so-called transpilers which translate and compile the, 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 a, a single not yet natively supported uh, JavaScript with an increasing number of these new features back into standards compliant uh, lower level JavaScript that is supported across browser. Um, the, you know, the browser vendors are moving fast. As I said, Edge is like really compliant already. I, it was nice to see Microsoft ahead of all others uh, in, in some significant and, and useful degree. So anyway, you know, I, I just thought I'd take a m moment to mention this because it is the language of of the net, and interestingly, boy, if you look at the at the hiring boards, uh, if you are a proficient JavaScript coder, uh, that's now the number one language that 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 companies are wanting for in order to to write web based apps for the net. Threema got an audit. I've talked about Threema off and on for uh, a couple of years, I guess. Um, I liked them from this first moment because they weren't free. You had to pay them a few dollars. In return, we understood their whole economic model. The other thing I liked about them is that their, their model was simple. Th they, remember, these are the ones where you had like three levels. You had yellow, I don't remember now what, uh, red, yellow, and green, where uh, like a level of confidence that... Uh, in the identity of the party 
to whom you were communicating because the ultimately greatest level was, you know, using QR codes to let each of your clients see the other's private key or I'm sorry, see the other's public key. The private key never leaves the client. And so basically it's a very simple public key chat system where they don't manage the like transparently manage user identity the way iMessage does. As we've discussed, iMessage is secure from Apple as long as there's no games being played with the public keys. But games can be played with the public keys that would go unnoticed. So Threema stays out of that. They put the burden on the user, which is why I've said if you absolutely really care I mean, really care about security, this is something that you'd want to use. So they've been audited by an independent Swiss uh, IT research lab that stated in rather uh, stiff terms, we confirm the quality of the system as claimed by Threema in their public specification. Um, and they said uh, uh, two, of, two of Threema's main promises are the whole communication, including group chats, media files, and status messages, is end-to-end -end encryption, is end-to-end -end encrypted, and Threema is designed to limit users' backtrack, uh, I'm sorry, designed to limit users' data tracking to a bare minimum. Uh, and, the, and the audit found that both these assertions were confirmed. Uh, Threema made their source code available, uh, their servers auditable, and their developer team provided for any assistance that was needed. So it was a complete, here's everything we're doing, uh, audit us as deeply as you can. And so in their report, the, the auditing agency said, Threema's concepts meet the requirements for truly secure and trustworthy messaging. The application of the encryption is correct and implemented as documented by Threema. The used protocols are free of known vulnerabilities. The app's local data is stored in a safe and secure manner. The server components only store data that is absolutely necessary for message delivery, so minimal store data storage, and the servers are located in Switzerland. So if anyone's interested, there is, I have a link in the show notes of the PDF of the entire audit. Uh, but... Uh, it passes. So it was nice to have that. Threema has a published security document that absolutely details every aspect of their protocol in 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 like full uh, full specification. Uh, and I did read through it a few months back just because I was curious. And you know, it looked as good as I could hope it would. Um, and they do have some new stuff uh, for their iOS client. It is now possible to use Threema to send any type of file, PDF, animated GIF, MPEG, uh, MP3 uh, audio, a doc, a zip, etc., cetera, um, up to 20 megabytes. Uh, group chat now supports up to 30 members. Uh, and then they also have a bunch of other improvements and bug fixes and, and Android support as well. So uh, good cross-platform support and lots of features. So I did just want to mention it, made the audit. Um, okay, quick, some miscellaneous stuff. NASA, <laughs> I got a bunch of tweets from people who picked up on this that was covered in a bunch of popular press saying that NASA was looking for 60-year-old engineers who still remember Fortran and assembly language. And of course, we know why our listeners <laughs> sent this to me. Uh, it turns out that Larry Zottarelli, who is the last original Voyager engineer still on the project, is retiring after a long and storied history at JPL. Uh, while there's still a few hands around who worked on the original project, the job of keeping what has become the, the Voyager uh, spacecraft, which was, has become an interstellar spacecraft going, will now fall to someone else. And that someone else needs to have some very specific skills. And I got a kick out of the fact that it was like, warning, you will only have 64K of memory. It's like, wow, 
you know, <laughs> that's that's hard to use. Hard to use that much memory. You know, Spinrite for the first uh, three versions was a com <laughs> file because it was less than 64K and did everything that Spinrite did with interleave optimization and everything else. So anyway, I got a, got a kick out of that. It is a problem. We've, we've seen this before. Uh, the... the uh, the shuttle was having this problem, and that is that the you know the shuttle engineers were retiring, yet the shuttle was you know itself hadn't yet been retired, and so it was just sort of a brain drain. We were losing the people who really knew how this stuff worked, um, and a bunch of people sent to me, and I wanted to thank everybody uh, for the notice that we are finally getting a new Star Trek series on CBS. Uh, it won't be premiering for a little over a year it'll be january 2017 but i'm hopeful its executive producer is alex kurtzman and of course he's well affiliated with star trek he did uh the first of the refranchise star trek movie in 2009 he also did into darkness uh he did spider-man 2 he was the executive producer of fringe uh, and MI3. And also, I just, I, in, in, in remi reminding myself what he did, I saw that he did Cowboys and Aliens. And I want to say, if anybody missed that, it is a fun movie. Cowboys and Aliens. If you didn't see it, uh, it's quirky, but it's a solid piece of work. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, we, we, I, I know nothing about what the new series will be. But uh, I've been lamenting that we don't have any really good science fiction on, you know, mainstream broadcast television. Uh, CBS is going to bring that to us. Okay, now, Leo? Yes? Fargo. Oh, the movie or the TV show? The, it is the best series on television. Oh, wow. I watch everything that is, like, at the top. I mean, I've been watching The Good Wife since the beginning. I like Madam Secretary. Um, Fargo is in its second season and it is arguably best than the first season that was really good. Now, I don't think I have ever seen a 9.0 on IMDb, wow. but, but that's what it has. I, I want to warn people. It's not for everyone. If anyone saw the movie, you'll remember the scene of with the wood, the wood chipper. chipper yes <laughs> yes i mean that that's like you know godfather with the horse in the bed or uh what's another classic one uh you know i mean you know there are scenes that just live in in movie infamy um you know maybe the shower scene with the knife in psycho, psycho but yeah. um okay so this is not like that but this is this is a little tarantino esque um, but the, the, I, I just want to say, if, if you don't mind a little bit over the top gore, uh, you know, like explicit murders and so forth. Oh my God. The writing is, is just titillating. The acting is superb. You, you probably want the first, you don't have the, the two seasons are not related. You don't have to watch the first season. Second season is, is I think it's had four, ep four or three, three or four episodes now, but I just watch it uh, and it's on FX. Um, I just watch it and I'm, I'm just mesmerized by the, by the, it's like art. It is, it's, it is television art. It's what we, there just isn't enough of. And so I thought, okay, it's not science fiction, but I just had to say to our audience, you know, again, with the caveat that it may not be cup of, your cup of tea, but if it is, you will be so glad you found it. And you've got a whole back season you could, you, you, you could just overdose on, binge watch, and then the second season that is – arguably better than the first right. so the reset so, so this is one of those series that reboots each season with new story new cor cast correct and correct. the reboot was even better you're saying which is kind of yes. cool yes yeah, that's uh, neat. i had mentioned to jenny who's watching it and she said you know she she reads extensively you know like you know like all the popular media, the New York Times and New Yorker, the LA Times and so forth. And she said she had seen the comments that second season is even better. Wow. And, and I agree. Good. First one, first season I loved. Second one, wow. We'll it's start just, watching it. So you don't need just, to have seen the first season at all. 
No, no. Okay. And and just so you, so you you could watch some of the second season to get a feel of it. Then you could watch the second, you know, the first season. You might kind of get them confused if you were interleaving them. Oh, okay. But really, right. but but you do need to start at the beginning of a season, whichever one you right, choose, right, right? Because they're definitely serially dependent, but the the seasons are independent. And oh, Leo, you will. I mean, it's it it's it's art. I mean, it's just it's like the best television. And I just wanted to make a quick mention. I 100% agree with you about Chromebook. Um, I've had two experiences with it now, uh, and I am very impressed with what it is. I agree with you. I've heard you say it now a number of times. For, for most people, it's all they need. And you turn it on and it boots in 15 seconds or yeah. maybe 10. Yeah. I mean, it's just on. And... It it does everything most people need. Um, I I gave one and I, I like the I like the Toshiba Chromebook. It's a little over three hundred bucks on Dell Amazon. Has a new mid range one that everybody's raving about. So I have to check how that much. One out. You know? I don't know. Let me look at it. Let me tell Cause you because the, their hardware is pretty good too. Yeah, I mean that's one of the unfortunate things is that Chrome o, Chrome OS is often stuck on essentially a netbook, so they can keep right. the price way down. Um, but Dell now has a 13-inch kind of business class Chromebook. I have a Pixel, the Google High End, and man, that's a that's a wonderful computer with touchscreen and everything. You know, I'd love you to do a uh, survey at some point of the security techniques they use in Chrome OS. In the Chrome yeah. OS, because it's really interesting. I think. Uh, yeah, 429, I agree. I... So it's a little more for the, th but it's 13 inches. You know, it's an HD display, and it's probably a little bit better hardware. In fact, I know it is. I've heard people talk about for what for, for what it's worth the toshiba is the 13 inch it's the they, they, they there's a, been a refresh of it that uses a faster processor oh good uh, and i saw some reviews that really liked it good. i think it's maybe 329 dollars or something on amazon so the my experience with uh uh these is you know i mean for instance this has got a an i3 or an i5 processor it's got eight gigs of ram the more the more hardware you throw at it, the the faster, more fluid these are. But boy, they're just—I think they're just great. And well, the and and, 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 and good. It, it, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's not going to get infected. Right. It's it. You know, if, if uh, in 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 the case of one person, she just needed to do uh, cloud-based accounting right. with QuickBooks, you know, Perfect. on on the net Perfect. and email. And it's like this is all you need. Yeah. And by the way, if you step on it, I'll get you another one. Right. That you know, right. it won't be the end of our life. Right, right. Uh, so good. Yeah, I well, just I I, I, I kept I kept seeing I kept seeing you recommend it. I know why I wanted to make a note mm -hmm. to say, yep, I agree completely. And Mark Seidel uh, tweeted me the news that the boiled frog analogy <laughs> I've been using is a myth. <laughs> I had heard that as well, that the frog actually does jump out after a while. <laughs> uh, exactly. So I just, you know, under a rata, I wanted to correct the record. Who's going to test that theory? Yeah, now I need another analogy, though, because it's a fabulous oh, one. Yeah. And we need something else like that. Like, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have one, I but, know. I, you know, yeah. I am putting out the, I'm, pu I'm putting out the call for a replacement for the boiled frog myth. Uh, the the Atlantic.com had an article back dated in 2006 uh, saying everyone who has heard a political speech knows this story. You put a frog into a pot of boiling water and it jumps right out. But if you put it in a pot of nice, comfortable water and then turn on the heat, the frog will complacently let himself be boiled. One standard version of the story is here. The reason it's so popular in politics is that it's an easy way to warn about the slow erosion of liberties yeah. or any other slow threat you want to talk about. Of course, that's the way I love to use the analogy. Here's the problem, writes The Atlantic. It just isn't true. If you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, <laughs> it will, unfortunately, be hurt pretty badly before it manages to get out, if it can at all. And if you put it into a pot of tepid water and then turn on the heat, it will scramble out as soon as it gets uncomfortably warm. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we would do if we were in a, if we jumped into a jacuzzi, into a jacuzzi right. too. It's like, yeah. ow, out we go, or, or ow, out as soon as it gets too hot. So sorry about my, my use of a bogus analogy. I, I wait 
for someone to propose a replacement because, boy, it's, it sure is great. Too bad it's not true. And uh, Mark, thank you for bringing it to my attention and our listeners. And uh, I'll just make a brief spin right note. Uh, I, in another tweet, uh, Mike spelled M-I-A-I-K, Mayak, Mayak, probably Mayak Musel, M-U-S-A-L-L, uh, he, uh, he said, spin right Q for SN. And this is one we get so often, I just wanted to cover it briefly. After, it, after fixing a faulty disk, is it wise to replace it ASAP or is, is it as good as a non-faulty one afterwards? And of course, of course, that's what people want to know because they had a problem. Spin right brought it back to life. Everything seems fine now. Now what? So... So the problem is there, there just isn't a true answer. Um, if the, uh, so you sort of have to use your intuition, but that can be aided by Spinrite's smart screen. Uh, and I've talked about that a couple times. And in fact, there is, there's documentation on GRC about Spinrite's smart screen. I have a couple pages where I where I show some examples so that people can to sort of help people interpret what it's showing. But the idea is that that Spinrite fixes the drive so that it's okay. But it could be that it is dying and so you've you've brought it back to life but it's still going to continue the process of dying. Or it could be that like for example the the the, the system got bumped when it was writing and that moved the head slightly off track so that that sector could not be easily read and it took spin right to come along and fix it. So there was nothing wrong with the drive. There was just an instance of an event that spin right fixed. The point is that in general, the smart data is very good at showing if the drive's just having overall trouble, the problem with smart by itself is that smart doesn't know that there's trouble unless trouble is actually happening. So the beauty of Spinrite and smart together is that Spinrite runs the, it, you know, runs the drive through its paces so that the smart data has an opportunity to pick up the fact that there's trouble happening if there is. And then it will show you. You get some red bars sort of descending um, uh, or, or actually it's sort of, the, I guess, cyan bars pulling back to reveal red. And the more red that's there, the more trouble the driver is having. And you probably shouldn't have any. So so the answer is if you, if, if you kind of think you know why there was a problem and Spinrite fixes it, you're probably still okay. But but check out that smart screen. It's one of the six or seven that you can rotate among when Spinrite's running. And after it's been running for a while, you know, flip flip the screens over and see if you see any red. Um, and that'll give you a good clue to whether eh, this drive, once we're done, it's probably a good idea to to image it and move it, move your data somewhere safer. That's a good tip. I didn't know that. That's good. I'll have to remember that. Because a lot of times you can get this false sense of confidence. Well, I was able to spin right it, and everything's right. good. Right, and and people do. People yeah. just say, "Yeah, this thing's kept my dying yeah. drive alive right. for twenty years." It's like, oh, right. okay, you know, they are so cheap now that it's like maybe a good time to while you're ahead. Uh, did we do the IT Pro ad yet? I guess not. Nope. One to so go. Let's do that, and then uh, we will talk about Apple's uh, in interesting uh, scheme yeah, <laughs> to they're, obfuscate they're, calls, uh, they're API in, calls. Um, they're in the doghouse. They're in the doghouse now. We're going to itpro.tv, a great place to go if you want to polish up your IT skills. And after all, that's something you need to do on a regular basis. Or maybe you want to get into IT. You listen to this show and you go, I understand everything Steve says. You should get into IT. And I don't mean just like fixing computers. You could be a certified ethical hacker or a crypto expert or a forensics expert. Huge need. Millions of jobs. Millions of jobs 
for these skills. Uh, and if you want to get these skills, of course, you could go and pay lots of money. I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars to a technical school to learn it. And uh, people do. Or you could spend thousands of dollars on study materials, and people do that too. Or you can go to itpro.tv. Normally, it's $57 a month, $570 for an entire year of great instructional courses. The nice thing about IT Pro TV is it's fun. It's fun. You're going to learn about the most respected vendors in the IT business from some of the best teachers in the IT business. You get your ISC squared security certificates. Adam Gordon teaches those classes. He wrote the book on security. Microsoft certs, Cisco, CompTIA, project management, Apple, MS Office. Sean Oriano, uh, Sean Philip Oriano is the teacher for the Certified Ethical Hacker. Of course, he teaches that to the military, to business, this is, he wrote the book of it on it, of course. From November 9th through 11th, see uh, Todd Lamley live on IT Pro TV. He's going to be recording his new course on Cisco Firepower and Advanced Fireside Administration. Todd really uh, belongs in the Cisco Hall of Fame. He is an absolute rock star when it comes to Cisco networking. And uh, he's written over 25 books, including his new book, Source Fire, SS Phipps, Firepower, with over 1 million copies in print. 1 million copies on a subject like that. Wow. <laughs> there, wow, there's some interest in this. That's coming up November 9th through 11th, and you can even watch free. If you're watching the live stream, it's free with a basic account, but you have to start 9.30 a.m. Eastern each day. And, of course, once you're a subscriber, all of the content's available for on-demand streaming anytime to any device, including your computer, Chromecast, Mobile devices, I, they have a new iOS and uh, updated a Roku app that let you resume playback between devices. You can speed up video and audio while you're watching. If you're one of those people who likes to fill your brain fast, they offered the Transcender. These are new practice exams with your subscription. That's $135 value. You also get over 100 step-by-step -step virtual machine labs walking you through setting this up in a virtual lab that requires merely requires an HTML5 browser this is such a great thing it's a low monthly subscription price there's daily updates new features monthly no hassle cancellation policy you know steve they've been with us now for two years this is their second anniversary tim and don came to twit and said we want to do this based on what you do and we want to advertise it on twit we were very pleased to have them they're yeah. now thirty thousand members in 75 countries over a thousand hours of content. They have two studios and they're adding 50 hours of content every week. In short, this is a hit and, and rightly so. So I want you to go to itpro.tv slash security now. You can uh, actually get a great deal of subscriptions, as I mentioned, 57 bucks a month. But we're gonna bring them down to $3.99 for a year or $40 a month if you pay monthly when you use the offer code SN30. That's 30% off and it's for the lifetime of your subscription. You'll also get a free seven-day trial, and then you can check it all out. So I, I encourage you to do this if, if this is for you. By the way, if you're a business they have co or a university, they have corporate and group pricing. They don't want to mention the names of their business clients, but their, uh, but their educational clients include Harvard, MIT, UCSD, University of California, uh, San Diego, and Stanford. You know, schools you might have heard of. I'm so proud of Tim and Don. They have made an incredible business. Two years in, and they're just going gangbusters. And uh, and they want you to be part of it. So if you want to polish up your skills or get that job you've always dreamed of, itpro.tv slash security now. Don't forget the offer code SN30 for 30% 30 off for the life of your account. All right, Steve, let us... It really, it, it really does make sense. Great? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the idea of, of doing this over the internet—it's the—it's the—it's good use. It's good use of the internet. Yeah, and they have a chat yeah. room just like we do. And you can ask. You know, they—they've got these uh, courses, these firepower courses coming up. I mean, uh, I don't know anything about Cisco Firepower, but you know, with one million copies in print of his book, I'm thinking this guy's a superstar. So you get a chance to go to the chat room and talk to Tom Lamley and ask him questions and. That's really special. I'm very, yeah. I'm thrilled with these guys. They've just done a great job. I'm very proud to be associated with them. And, you know, let's be, I've, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn, a little brag here. I think we helped put them on the map. 
I think you were the model. Yes. I think so. Well, not only they model themselves, but they started advertising at the beginning and they're doing great. So Yeah. One of our one of our success stories. All right, let's talk uh, okay. about Apple. Not such a success so this, story. This is this is sad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't want to be sad about my platform of choice, but um, okay. So, uh, as I promised, I I dug much deeper into this whole issue that I'd never looked at closely, of of vetting or verifying the behavior of apps. And um, they and you know we've covered a, no, a number of times through the years. There's been news of apps somehow sneaking through or getting past or or doing something undesirable despite Apple's best efforts. And and of course, just last week when I promised to give this deeper coverage, we talked about that that Chinese advertiser. Who was yeah? Who was who produced an SDK, a software development kit, which uh, which thousands of other Chinese companies incorporated into their own code, in order to in, in order to get the uh, access to uh, that advertising network, and how it, in in an analysis of it, it was clear that the that the the Chinese um, bad actor had sort of been creeping forward their boldness of of access to uh, uh, banned uh, uh, private APIs until they finally got caught. So, okay, what is this whole idea? So, um, what I came to understand from after I really got a grip on the whole structure is why Apple has this problem and, unfortunately, why it has no true solution. They have the problem because the original architecture of iOS assumed fully trusted applications. And it assumed fully trusted applications because the original concept of the iPhone was here's the apps from Apple that do messaging and mail and surfing and clock and calendar and so forth. And that's it. And I mean, when we look, when we look back on it, it's like hard to imagine that, that like that home screen that wasn't even full. I mean, remember, like the first three lines yeah. and maybe two two more icons or something. You know, well, I mean, you were I guess supposed, it had a you're supposed to be able to add apps uh, as web apps. So you'd go to the you could create a web app, and then the you go to it in Safari and you'd bookmark it on your home screen. And that Steve said that's all anybody would ever need to do because HTML5 apps are so powerful. We don't we just don't need to do an app store. Right, and HTML5 apps are so weak, meaning that. But well, like, yes, right. you know, they're they're powerful they're enough. Right, exactly. They're harmless. They're so you no. Know, so Safari does operate with in, in a in a constrained environment. It's well sandboxed, and it's actually uh, one exception to the apps. Normally, no iOS apps are able to do something called dynamic code generation. That is, they're not able to they're not able to use to, to execute data, but Safari is an exception. It has the dynamic code generation privilege because of its just, just in time compiler. So it's JIT, J I T, the, the just in time JavaScript compiler is able, it, you know, as it, as it processes JavaScript, it, that compiler produces code, but it's, data coming out of the compiler so it must have this privilege to have the essentially have the data that it generated execute well that's super dangerous because it, i mean in, in an environment where you have the expectation of scanning someone's code for for malicious intent which is itself difficult the idea that an app could rewrite itself 
after, well, like from runtime, when it's running, it could dynamically rewrite itself. And, and that's the difference between static and dynamic code analysis. A static analysis means that you're just you're running a a computer over the object code, you know, over the code, but you're not stepping a like a pseudo program counter through it to like follow its nooks and crannies and 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 jumps and things. You're just standing back and looking at it. So there's static analysis and dynamic. Okay, so the point is that Apple originally conceived of this architecture under the assumption that the app, the native apps running on the phone were from them, meaning they're not going to misbehave. And so those apps had unrestricted access to everything. They could do anything they wanted because essentially they were iconized pieces of the operating system. You know, they did run separately. They looked separate, but they were, you know, there, there was no clear delineation. Then with this incredible success of the phone, anybody who is our age, Leo, uh, or maybe any age, because I mean, it's not been that long, um, will we'll remember the huge pressure for third-party apps. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, it's nice, but it's closed. When are we going to get third-party apps? That's all. I mean, we love the phone, but everybody wanted third-party apps. So now Apple was in trouble. They had an architecture that had not foreseen, and that's the key. It had not foreseen the need for third-party apps at all. So they, so, and as we'll remember, it took them a while as a consequence of the fact that they weren't ready to do this. So what they did, unfortunately, was on one hand, the best job they could, but they couldn't do a good job. They, the, the way the system was built prevented them from doing a good job. Um, we talked a little bit about this last week, but now I have all the details. The, and and there, are, there are different development platforms for the iPhone. For example, you can write apps in standard C. An app in standard C can be enforced because a static analysis can see the functions that that C program calls. So you can do a static analysis of a straight C program. That, that's enforceable. The the problem is that the, the popular means of developing apps is Objective-C. And Objective-C, as we mentioned briefly last week, instantiates or calls methods in object libraries via sending a, a message, essentially a text message. It, it actually is. It is you you send a message to the 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 function in the library um, where a string is the first function parameter telling it what you want to do, and then there are succeeding parameters for that function. That's the way methods are invoked, the way things are you get things done in objective C. In the object, that you call is a dictionary, literally a list of the names of all of the functions and then pointers to the code that implements the function. So this, so your string is looked up in the dictionary for the starting location, the starting address of the function, and then the system jumps there to execute it. So it is... It is unfortunately that system, which is the major, still the majority. You know, there, there's you can write apps in C. Most of them are in, in Objective C because that was sort of the officially supported development platform. They're moving towards Swift, um, but Objective C is still where where we largely are today. So 
The problem is Apple understood that the the be, because again because of the legacy, the available functions were too powerful. There was like get hardware ID, get user ID, get. Uh, in, in list of installed apps, you know, get anything you want, basically. I mean, you know, it, the, the, like, like I said, there was there was no strong app OS boundary. The apps had the run of the place, and so suddenly they had to restrict apps so that they couldn't have the run of the place. So what they did was they went through the list of all of these strings, which an app should not use. And they essentially removed them from the header files. <laughs> they, they undocumented them. I'm not kidding. So, so the headers that the developers got didn't list the functions that they should not use. But they were still there. And the reason they had to be there is that Oftentimes, functions that they should use relied upon the functions that they should not directly use because the function they should use could be trusted to use the function they should not use in a safe way. So the idea was there was sort of a there was a there was a barrier between the application and the the off limits functions of good functions, trustworthy functions, basically watered down sort of app facing functions that didn't give any dangerous power to the application. And those were documented. But though but those functions that were running in that same user process had to have permission to access the unknown functions the undocumented functions behind them that also had to run in the same user process space. So but my point of that is you couldn't use process boundary rights where, where like the, the, the special functions had different rights privileges than the, the safe functions because the safe functions themselves Although the apps weren't supposed to call the dangerous functions directly, the, the, the safe functions had to be able to. So they got themselves painted into a corner. Invariably, developers reverse engineered these, the, the safe functions to find out how they worked. How was this safe function doing what it was doing because in order to do what it did, it would have to have knowledge that Apple wasn't telling apps they could have. But the functions they were calling had to have that knowledge. So that means you reverse engineer the function to find out how it works. And lo and behold, developers discovered that there were strings that were being called that weren't in the headers. And so they added those strings to their own custom headers, and now they could call them too. Ah, but Apple stopped them because what Apple can do is do a string search through the code. <laughs> That's pretty weak. I know. It is, <laughs> it is horribly All you have to weak. do is rot 13 or rot something. It, I mean, it, <laughs> exactly. Just exactly. Change the case. Yeah. You know, and then the string won't match. <laughs> and and then before you use it, switch the case back to what it's supposed yeah. to be and it runs. And so and, and then and then so Apple started, you know, saying, Oh, naughty, 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 we caught you using a function that isn't in the headers, and you're not supposed to do that. So you re you're rejected. And then that and then so so developers then had a choice. Okay, we play by the rules or off the books developers say, eh, you know, if we're if we're calling a function by a string, we'll, you know, we'll build it at runtime. Then a static analysis won't show it. And you and and in fact, the people who wrote this paper, they what you know, their whole trick is 
to push this sad state of affairs further towards a better state of affairs, but you can't do a perfect job. And in their own paper, they comment that their system attempts to be a dynamic runtime analyzer. That is, it, 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 it simulates user actions, pushing buttons. It follows the code paths. It, it essentially sort of is like running the app in sort of a fuzzing way of like doing all the possible things it can think of and trying to get the app to do something naughty, which it, then it would catch. And the problem is, and as they say in their paper, it's possible for there to be a, a complex interlock of, of sequences that that only then gets code to do something in a tricky way. It might even be the app going out to a remote server and receiving a certain token. And then the token, you know, provides a value that is used to jump to somewhere that you just, you that no dynamic analysis could catch. So my point is, this is fundamentally broken. It's, I mean... Apple's doing what they can. Isn't I, there the, some mechanism you could use? I mean, you know, just not documenting a call doesn't obviously stop somebody from using it. Can't you somehow limit, you know, who can use those calls? In some yeah, sort of mechanism? See, see, but the problem is that even the good code needs to use right. the privilege code to do what it needs to do. Right. And so, so if you... Uh, and, and, and why I guess doesn't all... Windows have this problem? Why? I mean, I guess there's no way to if just merely undocumenting it, not documenting it, doesn't mean you, you can hide it. So there well, are example, undocumented calls in Windows. Yes, I was going to say people use. Uh, yes, right? Windows has a long history of undocumented calls. They were things that Microsoft. Th th they were never things that were posed a security risk, though. They no, at no point. Was it like, oh my God, I found this undocumented call right. that does something amazing? Right. It was like, okay, I can draw a line myself rather than having it draw a rectangle. Right. right. Okay, big whoop. Um, but here, these really are things just due to the heritage that originally were available and still are to privileged apps. And, but, but the problem is the privileged libraries need to use them too. Right. And th there just isn't a way of drawing a boundary. Uh, or Apple would have. Instead, they, they, they're they just, uh, you know, they're screwed until they, until Objective-C is no longer supported. Why but would a different to, language it, make that better? Because, because what they could then do is enforce static binding. Uh, uh, binding is the technical term. This is dynamic binding. I get it. Where you bind with a string and you design the string at runtime. But a different language like C, C doesn't have anything like this. It's statically bound, so there's a list of every API that that program can call. And the fact that it cannot generate dynamic code means it can't change that. So there's nothing it can call that isn't in that list. So Apple vets it and signs it and never has to worry about its behavior. Objective C, because of this dynamic binding with strings, there's just no way to be sure. I'm thinking that's why they're pushing Swift. Yes, exactly. Does, so Swift does not allow that. Is that right? Swift Correct. doesn't allow dynamic binding. Correct. It doesn't have this problem uh, of basically calls being in, in a list in a dictionary. This is why we like functional languages. Uh, yeah, this is just... And I'm just... As an assembly language coder, the idea, even the idea of evoking a function by sending a message to somebody with the name that you want in the in the parameters, like, does that even run? Right. I mean, I'm surprised right. it is. I'm surprised it gets up in the morning. Well, it's you jump. You jump to a. You run something effectively by jumping to that area of code, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. And, you are and, you are doing a, an, a, 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 a just a, an immediate jump. Right. In there, this thing you're sending a message to a message dispatcher that then sends the message to the object 
that, and, and in the first parameter is the name of what you wanted to do, and then it has to scan through a dictionary to find a string match, and then it jumps. It's like, oh, I mean, and of course, what that does is it gives you all kinds of flexibility. You can put hooks anywhere you want. You could, you can over, I mean, this is the way superclassing works. You want to, you want to superclass a function or subclass a function. You're able to go in and like put your own function in for you the can overload where it. yeah exactly and or exactly and, and add functions i mean right. so there's there's that level of indirection creates tremendous opportunity and sure, power sure but the trade off is this is that it just does not handle well in in a high threat environment like mobile uh, a mobile platform where you're going to have what is it i i read it's more than a billion apps now and it's, you know, I oh, mean... no, no, more than a billion phones. Yeah, Sorry. more than a billion phones, more than a million apps, though. Right, um, right. It, you know, and I guess... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it's foolish to think... And when I say undocumented, I mean, one way you document these things is by putting them in the headers, but there's other ways to, you know, by just not documenting it, by not exposing it, you have a secret document at, at Apple that says how to do it. Um, right. And there's no way they could look... And say, oh, well, this is being called by an approved library. Oh, this is being called by a, a third-party app. They can't, they can't verify. That, well, it would add a lot of handling overhead, right? So, yeah. So, so um, the, the problem is that the approved library, to do what it needs to do, has to call secret functions. Yeah, no, I understand that. But that's, yeah. you could say, well, this is, a li this is an approved library calling it as opposed to my app. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is that that would require, um, well, it, I guess it would require a level of per-call auditing. Just a lot of overhead. That they, yeah. for, I mean, it must be infeasible or they would have done it. Right. Instead, they're, instead, what we know they're doing is just scanning the app for, for functions you're, you, you're not supposed to call. Right. And, and, as we, and we've seen proof now that all you have to do is build those function names dynamically. Yeah. And it, it's, they, 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 the vetting process doesn't see them. And now we know why. Yeah. Wow. Well, I know. It's That's just interesting. I, you know, it seems like somebody should have observed that that was a potential problem <laughs> way back when. Well, it's actually why I called it a scam. It, the whole, I mean, yes. They were just hoping nobody would notice. They were hoping this would be a good enough and and that like removing things that were found to be misbehaving after the fact is then the best they can do. Somebody reports the behavior or it's observed and then they take it out. But it, it is a very weak filter. Objective C goes back to next step, which of course OS ten is based on and Right. In fact, there's like a there there's a table called the nib table. Right. Uh, that's part of this. And that that that's the next interface builder. Well, or and something. all the Function names are NS something, which stands for yep. next step. Yeah. So uh, this goes back to the next computer. And, of course, you know, in the mid-90s, nobody was thinking about this. No. In fact, everybody yeah. thought this was a great thing. Dynamic and message, dynamic, you know, uh, function calling is a great thing. Yes. Very powerful. Yes. <laughs> and as long as it was only your apps. Right. Who then cares? There's no, right. there's no problem. Right. And so that's what they did. And then the world made them allow third-party apps, right. and that's the problem. So at that point, somebody in Apple, probably Avi Tavanian, st stood up and said, you know, Steve, if you do this, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you're going to have a problem. It's amazing they've gone eight years It is before anybody took advantage of it. It is. You know, th I mean, there have been... Uh, Anecdotal reports, you know, we we we've covered them. There have been apps that have been caught doing misbehaving things. Yeah. Um, by, and this is how they were doing it. Right. But now it's, I mean, now everyone knows, and so I don't know. Apple, I hope, I mean, e either they retire Objective C, they they implement some better way of catching this dynamic behavior, uh, or. Or really spend some time increasing, you know, doing a dy a dynamic analyzer like this this 13 page uh, research paper uh, demonstrated. They were able to capture va uh, thousands of apps. They scanned 
thousands of apps and found hundreds that were using off the books function calls. Wow. Now, Android is written in Java. Does Java have the same uh, dynamic calling thing? I think not. I think Objective C was very advanced for doing this. This was very sophisticated. Interesting. Are you looking looking for the? Yeah, this is the paper. I they the uh, they had. A, I don't. I don't. I don't remember where I said. Yeah. Where they had their. Uh, All right. By the way, somebody, I apologize to Coco. Coco, when we were talking about Fortran, typed some Fortran code into the uh, chat room and got booted because, as Ooh. it turns out, Fortran code's all in uppercase, and we forbid that. <laughs> so we <laughs> no, have to, shouting. <laughs> no, no shouting. So we have to write a, uh, an amendment to the bot. So you, don't, you can't plan for everything that says, but if, you know, no uppercase unless it's Fortran code, then that's okay. So, so these guys say, to show the effectiveness of our approach, we have analyzed more than 2,000 iOS applications. Our research shows that a non-trivial number of iOS applications use security-critical private APIs oh, to access and collect sensitive user information. Wow. So, so this it's not, is happening. This is, hap this is something people discovered and have been using. Yes. Exactly, and, and yeah. it went through the underground, and then it spread yeah. over time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as is invariably going to happen. Well, I as mean, you mentioned, there was always a brisk uh, market for undocumented Windows uh, API calls because you could do stuff that uh, was undocumented. But the risk oh, was, and by the way, same thing on OS X, but the risk always was, well, it might get deprecated, and, and then your, your application would break. Yes. Uh, Microsoft would always say, we we will guarantee. not be held right. to the future of anything not documented. Right. And and th what it was in the early days of Windows, because I was coding Windows back then, it was Microsoft seemed to be able to do things that right. you couldn't do through it the made, documented made people API. mad, yeah. Yes, we were, like, we were like, wait a minute, how did they do that? <laughs> I want to be able to, to, to do that. Right. And it's like, there's no way to do it. You can't get there from here. Um, unless you, you know, and then people would reverse engineer their code and say, hey, hey, what's this call? You know, and then it was, turns out to be useful. Oh. And so I just thought of how Apple could fix this. They have to change their tool chain. They have to modify Xcode. They, and what they'll have to do is they'll have to say, we will not approve any apps that are not written by a authenticated Xcode compiler. And then in their compiler, they have to make sure that because can't the compiler see what? It, well, I guess it can't. Can it no. see what it binds time would be? What it would the call would do? No. No, because because the code at runtime could assemble something from pieces that right. would not be obvious. And the and the and the compiler can't test the runtime. Well, or say for example, the 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 app could literally go to a remote server. To get the name of the function. Yeah, right. So can't, it doesn't exist anywhere that. in the... Right. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, if you want to... Q&A next week. Okay. Here's how you do it. You can tweet him uh, at SGGRC. Steve uh, it responds to tweets, to tweets and to twits. He'll even respond to, to long DMs. Because he's got open DMs, I would uh, nothing I would do. But anyway, at sggrc, <laughs> it's worked for him. Uh, you can also uh, go to grc.com/feedback and do the feedback form there. We'll assemble questions. Steve will assemble questions from that pool of questions. We'll answer those next week. Security news allowing. While you're at grc.com, check out Spinrite, the world's best hard drive and recovery and uh, maintenance utility. Awesome stuff. And lots of freebies, too. Steve's bread and butter is spin right, but he gives back all the time with so many great things like Password Haystacks, the Squirrel Project. You can read all about it, even vitamin D. It's all there. Uh, as well as 64 and 16 kilobit versions of this show, audio, as well as transcripts, grc.com. We have the show as well, audio and video, at twit.tv slash sn. And, of course, you can always subscribe uh, the, every podcatcher has it, including soon Google Music, uh, Stitcher, Slack, podcast apps. They're all, we're there. Just search for security now. 
Steve, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Leo. Bye-bye. Security.